Hey bosses, before we get started, I want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon members. You guys are the reason why we're able to have Derek, who's the new team member of Invest Like a Boss, on scheduling interviews, diving in deeper into topics, and really just helping us produce more episodes. So instead of having just one or two episodes a month, now we have three or four because of you guys. So big thank you, and thanks to our new Patreons. We have Andre Gusco, Rainier Nakul, uh, Sam, Stu Hilbrandt, Tony T, Theodore Phil, Town Miles, uh, Ross Paul, Ray, Nana Hertis, Michael McGinnis, Matt McCabe, Kurt Miller, Joe Boulan, Haig Boyadan, Donald Hearn, Don McRae, Alan Bailey, Abby, Roos Hughes, Peter Head, Nicholas Rosen, Nick Ringling, Jonathan Lian, and Ian. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey bosses, this is Johnny and welcome to episode 147 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm in Sri Lanka. Sam is somewhere in the dark with no electricity. Somewhere more <laughs> third world than Sri Lanka. Where, where are you at, buddy? I'm, I'm in Charlotte. And the funny thing is, is normally it's me griping with Johnny because he's got bad internet and his uh, $8 a night bungalow in Sri Lanka. But actually, his internet's been great ever since he's been in Sri Lanka. And my internet in Charlotte seems to be going out uh, every time we try to record an episode. <laughs> yeah, and I pay like 10 bucks a month for my internet. It's great. Yeah, and you know what I have? I have Google Fiber. And it's not as exciting as it as people think it is. It's like normal internet speed. It seems like it's really really bizarre. Yeah, that is strange. And Google Five, the cell phone plan, it's great because it's, in, it's international, but it's ten dollars per gig. I'm paying fifty uh, cents a gig with a local SIM card here in Sri Lanka. Wow, oh, man. Well, Johnny, what is this now? Is this going on four months that you've been there? Uh, five months. I, I'm, I'm five pretty much Sri Lanka now. I see, I've seen some of your recent photos and you do look like you're becoming Sri Lankan. Have you ever noticed, like, no matter where in the world you are, that the dogs in that country start looking a little bit like the people in that country? Like, if you're in <laughs> Russia, the people are a little bit more, like, the dogs are a little bit more Russian looking. And if you're in, like, Florida, the dogs are a little bit more Florida people looking. It's weird. I think you do actually do blend your environment a little bit, both people and animals. Yeah, uh, you know what? I don't know comment on that. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, take a look. Yeah, but next <laughs> week, uh, in the next episode, 148, we're going to be doing our quarterly wrap up, and there's going to be a lot to talk about. Both Sam and I had made big investments, big new purchases, and there's all the craziness in the world, and there's, there's all the travel stuff. So make sure you guys are subscribed, and make sure you guys tune in for that next episode. But this week, we have a fun episode to lighten things up because I'm sure all your other podcasts, all your other news are doom and gloom and worry. Not here, guys. Not here. Well, let's let's be honest. This is something that a lot of us have thought about, but we've never really div- dived into the topic in a long form. But, Johnny, why don't you give a little background on how we even got, got to this episode because it came up pretty quick. Yeah, so Sam and I were at a strip club in Eastern Europe, and we were thinking <laughs> – That is not how I was thinking you were going to start the story. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm surprised. On. Go yeah. on. Okay. This so, is true. <laughs> yeah, that was true. So a few years ago, Sam and I were at a strip club in Eastern Europe, and we did not think about investing at all. Fast forward two years, in episode 146 on coffee shop economics, I had the idea that, hey, if all these coffee shops are such low return on investment, why not you know, uh, invest or start the cheapest one possible that has the highest profits. And those are the bikini coffee shops. If you guys haven't heard the episode, it's actually a really interesting, fun topic. That's last episode. But from there, we're like, well, you know, bikini uh, coffee shops, you know, driving coffee shops, strip club, coffee, you know, economics. I wonder how much they make. Yeah. And we've, you know, for those of us who have visited a strip club, dance hall, if you will, uh, in the past, I mean, you you see money being thrown around all the time, right? 
But there's got to be a massive divide in the way that money is, is made because it's, it can't be picking up the dollar bills on the stage. It's got to be from the dances and the champagne room and things like this. And we've all heard stories of, of dancers or strippers that have made hundreds of thousands of dollars in a year. So it's obviously a profession that is lucrative and something that Johnny and I, you know, were always interested in. So we decided just to dig into it uh, off the heels of that coffee shop economics episode. And I think I think this is going to be a really fun episode. I'm, I'm excited. And Johnny, I'm excited that you're going to uh, you're going to dive into it. I think our guest is Lauren Allen, and um, she's basically a hustler. She teach she's a past uh, dancer stripper. She's got a, a lot of different professions that kind of loop in the dancing profession, like bachelor party stuff. Uh, and she's also a teacher. She teaches dancers and strippers how to make more money and, and basically use and apply sales tactics to increasing the, um, the you know, their, their skill and trade. Yeah, so Lauren's definitely a side hustler. Uh, yeah, she still strips today. Uh, she just does mm. uh, private bachelor parties instead of at a club just, just so she can do it on her dime. And, and I think it makes more money. But it was fun diving in kind of into the the back and you know, locker room of strip, you know, the, of strippers, how much money they actually make. Do they pay taxes? Mm -hmm. Like where does that money come from? How, you know, what's a good day? What's a bad day? What do they spend their money on? What do they invest money on? So it's, it's going to be an interesting episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, don't expect to learn too yeah. much about investing itself in it, but <laughs> definitely, you know, it's going to be a fun episode. So take a listen. Yeah. And uh, thanks to all of our Patreons and Boss Lounge. We got a lot of questions from you guys on what you wanted to hear in this episode. And we made sure that Johnny was able to get those out. So without further ado, let's hear it from Lauren Allen and Johnny FD. Hey, Lauren, really great to have you on the show. I'm really excited to have you. Yes, thank you so much. I've been excited about this one all week, so yay. Yeah, <laughs> me as well. And it's funny that Sam threw this interview on me. Normally he does interviews, but he's like, he's like, go ahead, Johnny. I'm sure you'll enjoy this. But actually, the, the way that this topic even came about was our last episode was about coffee shop e economics. <laughs> and... It was a little bit different than investing, but you know, during these kind of weird times, people were like, "Oh, well, what else can I use, you know, do with my money to start a business?" And in that episode, we had talked about the most profitable coffee shops being the bikini coffee shops, the bikini baristas. Have you ever heard about that? Yes, yes, I've seen those before, and I'm always terrified for those girls because I'm like, "Oh, fuck! Don't spill anything on your your beautiful titties," but. <laughs> <laughs> I, it makes sense. Everyone loves coffee and everyone loves beautiful women. So makes sense. Yeah. And I've heard that guys will drive like 45 minutes out of the way, the morning commute, just for like the few minutes that they get to flirt with these girls and see them in not only bikinis, but, you know, like there's costumes every day. There's like, you know, Tuesday oh, themed like days or whatever. Yeah. That's actually so smart, too, especially during the time where a lot of clubs are shut down. So it's like you can still – you get your coffee fix and then you still get to see your favorite girl in her costume. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Without just having like, to like be in the club. Exactly. And, and like it takes five minutes so you can kind of just, you know, just sneak by. But like I need coffee anyways. I might as well go here. <laughs> it's just 30 miles out of the way. No big deal. Just a slight detour. It's fine. <laughs> it's yeah. worth it. Actually, so first random question before we get into your backstory about the economics is I'm, I'm sure you've seen like every type of random customer kind of guy. Do you think like why do you think guys go to strip clubs? Really interesting. Everyone has their own reasons, but I think at the end of the day, the general theme I found is that everyone's looking for something, whether it be some kind of comfort, some kind of relationship. Um, some are looking for some kind of fulfillment in a way. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of times it's men. The clientele is usually men that comes into the club. They're normally older. They're normally at least like middle age and they have a family. They have responsibilities. So it's kind of a chance for them to get away, have some fun, like throw some money around and really unwind so that they can go back to work and home with a little bit of time for themselves. It's almost like a, a lot of times it's men's form of self-care, if that makes any sense. 
Yeah, as, as weird as it sounds, <laughs> I have a really good buddy named Henry. I hope he doesn't mind me uh, shouting his name, but he loves <laughs> strip clubs more than anyone I know. And when I asked him, like, wh- why he spent so much money there, he, he says, you know, Johnny, like, I, I don't have a country club membership. I don't, uh, you know, like, I don't like going to normal bars or, or clubs. He's like, this is my country club. And it's almost like he has his budget set aside. He's like, you know, I go here, you know, after a long day of work before, you know, I go back to, you know, my stressful life. This is where I just blow off steam. I just have fun. I know I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have smiles. I'm going to, you know, pump up my endorphins. I'm going to go home happy. Yeah, seriously. It is almost like investing in itself. It is. It's it's definitely like an investment that a lot of guys like to make. I completely agree. It's... It's just a chance to, it's this weird vortex. The strip club's definitely this weird place where everyone's beautiful and everyone's having fun. The music's always on. So it's like this little vortex away from the regular world, away from stress. And then, you know, women will just kind of like laugh at all your jokes and, you know, give you all the attention and drink with you. Right. So it's, it's pretty, yeah, for men, it is like a little safe haven, I believe. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's the same reason why, you know, I, I think why women will go get their hair done or their nails done or go get a massage. Yep. It's just like, you know, it's, it is investing in yourself. So I, I'm appreciative of uh, you and all the other dancers working out there. So thank you. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, can you tell us, like, how did you actually get into the industry? Like, when did you start dancing and what was your motivation behind it? Yeah, so mine's a little, my story's a little after school special, a little dramatic, right? I started stripping when I was 19, and it was actually right at the end of an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of in this weird place. I had been traveling a lot with this ex. I didn't really have any money left. I kind of went from, you know, being in school and having two jobs to just kind of like going off and having my little adventure. So... Pretty much everything was coming to an end, and I had a friend that worked in the club, and I'd always been a dancer and just very just out there and comfortable in myself, so it wasn't really a shocking turn of events or anything. Like, anyone that knows me personally is like, oh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that coming. Yep, yep. (laughs) Makes sense. Makes sense. (laughs) So it was a natural progression, right? So I ended up going to see my friend at the club after a weekend and pretty much long story short, my ex left me without like took the last of the money that I had and like left. It was this big mess. So I went to the club and I was fucking terrified, but I ended up doing so good my first night and I had like $800 in my hands. It was the most money I'd ever made in one sitting. It's the most money I'd ever held in my hands at one time. So I was just like, all right, well, fuck this guy. Let's get it. <laughs> wow. $800 on your first day. Yeah. Was that was that more than you expected? Way more than I expected. And honestly, all the girls were shocked because I was selling champagne rooms. I know we'll get more into that kind of stuff, but yeah. um, champagne rooms are like the VIP option, right? So my first night I was selling champagne rooms. So I guess it was just uh, – meant to be <laughs> wow okay nice actually so that's a good uh, lead way so there's different ways to make money uh at the at the club and most guys we assume you know that you make all your money through those dollar tips on stage but that's probably not true right right, <laughs> right. it's like don't spend it all in one place baby here's your two dollars <laughs> yeah definitely most of the big money that i've made in the club has come from the more VIP offers, at least private dances at the very least. Some clubs don't have the champagne room option. The champagne room is really just a private room. And usually the lap dances generally, at least most places I've worked, it's a sort of private area. You get a little booth, right? So you get a little booth or you upgrade and go to the room. And there are table dances some places where it's just like out in the open, you know, have a girl grind on you. And <laughs> yeah, that's us- That's generally the way you make your money. Like on stage, it can be, it can be okay, it can be pretty good. But 
generally the bulk of it is through more one-on-one and, and selling and upselling. Okay, that definitely makes sense. And how, does yeah. the house get a cut, like, or do they, do they charge you a flat rate? Do they get a percentage? How does that work? Oh yeah, so <laughs> it really fuck. I need to open a strip club. That's all I have to say. Because um, we go into work and they charge us a house fee of some kind. So uh, they they call it all kinds of names, and it's usually anywhere between like twenty and fifty. I've paid like a hundred at some places at some times, right? Sometimes they charge more for the high times or if it's late or whatever it is. And usually you have to tip everyone out. You don't have to, of course, because it's illegal, but you know, you're an asshole if you don't. So you, we do usually tip the DJ a good amount on your dances. It's, it's all, there are no rules really. So it's just kind of dependent on your, personal preference sometimes like 10 percent of what you make for the night you'll give to the dj maybe you'll tip out security and some of the door guys and it's always different some places haven't taken anything out of your dances some people take five to ten um that's usually general room of thumb is like five bucks a dance and then when it comes to the champagne rooms hell yeah they charge at least a hundred bucks, they take a hundred bucks from like a half hour or, you know, 200 for an hour. But a lot of clubs, you can charge whatever you want for the champagne room VIP upsell. And, you know, that way you can kind of figure that into your price. Sometimes, sometimes it's like, oh yeah. So the, it's like 300 for the hour and we're taking 200. So you get a hundred, right? It really depends on the club. It's totally lawless. Okay, that definitely makes sense. And I, I guess one big question I have is, I assume, you know, every dancer, they, they want, you know, those moonshots. They, they, you know, they, they, it's much easier, I'm assuming, uh, to make, you know, $300 or $500 in the champagne room than it is to get on stage, you know, 10 times a night. But is, or do you think a lot of girls would, like, you know, it's more like the, does the what like the, that the slow tortoise win or the fast um, you know rabbit win? Like, like, do you think that the girls who kind of just pick and choose and they're like, you know what, I'm not gonna deal with these twenty dollar dances. I'm not gonna deal with you know, you know, I'm not gonna be bothered with you know getting these you know these uh, these small tips. Do you think that those girls end up actually making more money, or you know, or at least consistently, you know, at the end of the month? Or do you think the girls who you know, just kind of wait around and like, I'm only going to deal with the ballers, you know, willing to spend 300 bucks. Yeah, that's a really good one. Just because it's, it's so interesting because in the club you get so many different kinds of people. A lot of times you're overstimulated and there's, and sometimes there's no way of knowing who has what. I really do try not to judge or like look for a specific kind of clientele or a certain kind of person because fucking no a lot of the time. But I have, I did adapt my hustle as I grew, especially in the last year of being in the club, because I'm more like part time, actually, like mostly not in the club now. But um, I started by doing less dances and going a little bit slower, but upselling the champagne room more. And I did find that I was making more money and it was a lot, it was just a lot better to kind of direct my focus and energy on a guy for, you know, maybe sometimes upwards of 20, 30 minutes that I wouldn't have, but I get a bigger chunk rather than having to run around and get dances from like 10 other guys. Cause I've done both and you can kill it at whatever style it is. But yeah, I would say that I do enjoy the hustle of maybe slow and steady, but getting a bigger return. Because it's like less energy expelled. It's mm-hmm. more creating more of a connection, more of an experience for the person as well. But yeah, you can't, you really can't judge. I think girls will miss out on a lot if they're judging based on like, oh, he he's wearing this. Like some of the, mil- the millionaires, man, they're dressed like Steve Jobs or they have like <laughs> New Balance sneakers on, right? You can't, you can't judge at all. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. What cities have you danced in? I've danced in Las Vegas. Um, I actually danced in San Francisco a a while ago. Um, And before they changed all their laws and stuff where they make it hard for you to dance there. Um, I've danced in Houston, 
all over Florida, all over Florida, because that's where I'm from, and Atlanta. So I've been, I've done some traveling. Yeah, I've done yeah, that's fun. a little bit. And yeah, it is very fun. Do you tra- do you travel and, and dance more as a way to travel and to change it up? Or, you know, are you like, you know, uh, going towards events, you know, whether it's the Super Bowl or, you know, like some big conference yeah. or something? So actually now um, my really good friend and I, we both met in the club and now we our side hustle aside from our businesses that we have is doing bachelor parties. So that's actually had more. So we do like the private private parties and that's had more traveling with it which is pretty fun if we are traveling and dancing we definitely are strategic about it and we're like okay what what time of year is it maybe do some research and if there is a big event like there's usually if i do dance in daytona beach florida i like to go when it's bike week or when it's daytona 500 and the week before is always great because everyone's settling in and they've still got all their money right so Mm -hmm. Being strategic with events and time is really good, but it's also kind of a toss-up, right? Because sometimes it's oversaturated. If you go to a big city where there's a big event, so a lot of girls are flocking. So that's another thing to keep in mind, too. Is it pretty easy to show up to a city and just start dancing? Or do you, do you call them ahead of time? Like, like you know, do you send them a, like a, a resume or photo? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just picturing myself bringing my like vanilla <laughs> resume to the strip club. Like, <laughs> that's good. Oh man. Uh, so again, this whole industry is not regulated at all. So every state is different. Cities are different. Counties are different. Everyone has different laws. So um, generally, it is pretty easy to kind of show up in a city. And just like fuck most places in Florida, you just show up and it's like they look you over. It's like okay, come on. But places like Vegas and a lot of pla- California specifically, you have to have uh, some sort of planning. Especially um, in Nevada, you have to get a license, you have to get fingerprinted, you got to get a sheriff's card. So you're already looking at like a three hundred dollar investment and a whole day at the the fucking at the DMV. So. So it really just depends. Certain places, yeah, it's going to be a process. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And have you found it profitable to fly around and, you know, go to these these events to dance at? Or is it more, you know, it pays for your trip and you're like, okay, I can get out of Florida? When you're already in the hole, it's, it's you know, it's kind of tough, um, especially like with flying and especially my Vegas trip. My Vegas trip, I didn't profit, even though I did have a good time in Vegas, of course. And that was just fun. But definitely didn't profit because, man, it's like you could easily already get a couple of Gs in the hole just from, like, flying and food and if you go out and then for lodging and then whatever else it is. And especially Vegas, you know, it's like 300 bucks just to get started. So it, it really it's it really depends. It definitely makes sense. And have you ever tried doing like w- like webcamming or online, you know, dancing? I have tried. I did try webcamming actually a long time ago before I started stripping, and that was kind of my intro. Um, I haven't tried it since. I don't see why I wouldn't. Because why the fuck not, right? But it's definitely. I think it's just a, it's it's just a different, just different. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a different world out there. And one of the questions that people had in our in our private Facebook group, the Boss Lounge, is what are the financials like? Like, can you make more money doing it from home on a webcam? It seems you know easier, you know, safer, uh, you know, or, or do people do it in person because you make that much more money? That's the thing. I with this industry, it's. It's kind of impossible to duplicate what in-person contact can do with this industry, right? That's why guys like to go to the club because they love the experience of being there. They love to touch you. They love to see you. So it's definitely a learning curve, I think, to transfer that kind of connection to online. Definitely. Yeah, and I'm sure there's you know some girls who you know make good money online, but there's way more competition. Absolutely. Now, yeah, I mean, every girl has an OnlyFans now, you know, every girl's hopping on webcamming without knowing what they're doing, you know, expecting. And of course, 
strippers are hopping on and they're like, where's my instant gratification? Where the fuck's my money, right? But it takes time, obviously. It takes some know-how and everything. So I know girls that do kill it and they, they've got their thing, but normally they kill it by having some sort of niche or they've taken time to really build up a loyal audience, right? And that's not necessarily something that happens overnight when the clubs are closed and you're trying to figure it the fuck out, so. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. So everybody wants to know what's like the least you've ever made in one night and how much is the most you've ever made in one night? So I've made over five grand, um, over five grand in one night and my biggest weekend. So like two days of, of doing parties was, um, 8,000, 8,000. So that was like my biggest weekend ever wow. in two days. Um, yeah. Which is actually recently crazily, <laughs> crazy enough. It was like last month. So that was really fascinating. Uh, um, the least I've ever made, would probably be like 40 bucks that was yeah been there been there before so like on those kind of really slow nights you know if you have a couple in a row kind of what's going through like you know it, it i'm sure it happens to a lot of dancers like is it usually because it just happens to be a slow day or like what what normally causes that yeah, normally it can be slow. Sometimes you just fucking throw in the towel and get frustrated and leave and cut your losses. Been there too. And sometimes you are you can just be out of it. Like there are times where the club is perfectly packed and I'll go up to people and just like fucking strike out. And my lines aren't landing and no one's responding, right? There's just times where people aren't into it or, they're, or you're not on, on it or... There, there's a million different reasons why and definitely it can have it can have a damper on your mindset for sure especially after maybe a couple of nights of just like fuck or it's slow where every person you approach is not feeling it because it happens definitely can put a damper on your mindset that's why you know i love like coaching strippers specifically on their mindset is because it's you have to be strong and resilient to do this work you really do yeah i could definitely see that so on those nights that you you know you you kill it you know you make a thousand dollars or or that weekend you made eight thousand like what like what are you doing with that money like what did you do that weekend when you had eight grand in your pocket burning a hole probably like what did you do with that money oh my god yeah well definitely saved half of it and honestly like just paid like just paid bills you know especially that was my first um, party back after. Um, first part actually so i like paid my taxes and did my paid my bills and saved it like such an adult right such an adult um took myself to the spa though i did do that like to catch up on everything you know get my hair done after quarantine and all of that but yeah it was i was very adult with this one for sure <laughs> especially oh, nice. after three months of nothing <laughs> okay a good yeah. job so two questions on that oh, yeah. one is taxes is it kind of like any other tip-based business, whether you're like a, you know a server, where you kind of just report to the government how much you made, or do they assume it? Like, how does that work? Oh well, I pay all of my taxes. Of course, yes. IRS. If you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> I pay all my taxes. Yeah. So it really. So it. I guess it depends. Um, there's a lot of girls that just like keep their money in the in the shoebox under the bed, um, but it is it's the same. If you're depositing your money, you do have to like pay taxes on it. They don't assume because um, we like we fall under like the solo profiteer. We we fall under that category. So, or you know, like for me, I have an LLC, and I know a lot of girls that do have an LLC and an S corp and stuff like that. So. Yeah, there's no assumptions. We just still have to we have to figure it out and what we deposit we're we're liable for. That makes sense. Did you did you get an LLC bec because you're a, like you're a dancer or for your other business? Like do, do like a, like if a girl's just stripping, does she need an LLC? She doesn't need one, but it also it helps. It helps. Yeah, definitely. I got an LLC because of my business. Um, a lot of and most Honestly, most strippers that do have an LLC have a business. So 
most of the time strippers aren't just getting LLCs, but you know, I don't see why not. And, and what are some of those businesses that, that strippers run on the side? So let's see, there's, there's, be, there's becoming a lot more stripper like coaches, like helping strippers with their hustle or, you know, helping strippers build their own businesses. Right. Like so kind of like stripper business coaching, that's becoming more of a thing in the last year or so. Um, let's see. So strippers have like their own little boutiques or they make clothes or, you know, they have like a makeup line of some kind. So there's, there's all kinds, all kinds of stuff or like open a restaurant or something. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Why not? All right. Yeah. Why so, not? But. So you said that you, you saved half of that money that you, um, that you made that weekend. In general, do you just have money in a savings account? Do you have it like do you have any investments? Like where do you put your money? Yeah, so I have so I've got obviously like some I've got cash that's saved. I also have a savings account. Um I deposit like most of my money into the bank. Um just to so I can prove my income. But yeah, I haven't I haven't ever invested. I've never invested. Um I honestly don't know much about investing, but I'm learning more and yeah, like I'd I'd love to at least get, you know, a Roth IRA and I want to learn more about just investments cuz I'm not I'm not privy. That's right. All. You you can take a listen to some of the back episodes of of this podcast. But I'm assuming Yeah, I'm, that's why I'm yeah. excited to come on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I'm assuming that most nancers are also not investing their money. Like even if they're making they're killing it. Yeah, definitely not. Just because I, I think the biggest thing that's always held me back is the fear, right? And like the, the ignorance where it's like, well, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And there's a fear of like, oh, I just want to like hold on to the money and not mm. like put it out there. Right. So I think that definitely held a lot of dancers back. I, I can see that. But the, the one piece of advice I would give all the dancers if you're listening to this, including yourself, is if you don't invest the money, you're probably going to end up spending it on something else. So even if you made a yep. bad investment, you're probably still way better off. So true, right? It's so fucking true. Thinking about all of the dumb shit that, you know, that we've ever bought with our money. It's like, might as well put it somewhere where it could potentially grow or something. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. So speaking of like not like non money investments, but like you know, let's say buying new outfits or getting a, uh, you know, like buying shoes. Are these things that actually do they actually make more money for for dancers? I'm a really low maintenance dancer, right? I have my one pair of knee high boots, and I have like some really nice lingerie from Victoria's Secret, um, but. I haven't invested a lot into outfits because I think it can easily become a money pit where you're just spending all of this money on outfits and all this stuff. Um, I feel like working on my sales skills and, you know, taking sales courses or getting a mentor that helped me make more money and not necessarily like my makeup or my outfits or my shoes. Honestly, that that's the way that I perceive it. I'm super low maintenance. So yeah, because I, I see a lot of girls, they, they'll spend a big portion of, their, portion of their money buying different shoes, di different outfits. And as a mm -hmm. patron or as, as a customer, I'm like, I don't care what you're wearing. Like, if you're hot and you're on stage, like, you can wear the same yeah. black bikini every day. I wouldn't even notice. Dude, I, I, yeah, I think that women forget because I'm like, do you forget who we're dealing with here? We're dealing with mostly men. Like, they don't give a fuck. They're like, can you fucking take that? five hundred dollar outfit off like can i like can, can you take off that really expensive underwear right it's yeah it's it's really funny I'm like we're mostly taking this shit off anyway what the fuck <laughs> yeah and also guys don't see you every day it's really just the other girls who are seeing what you wore they don't realize you wore the same thing seven days in a row oh yeah yep so it is it's kind of for the other other strippers like flex a little bit Oh, also, I'm kind of a sailor. I hope that's okay. I've been cussing like a... I was about to say like a motherfucker. Is that... That's all right. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a disclaimer okay. at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> right? Like, you just let them know. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're okay. We're like the Wolf of Wall Street of uh, of investment podcasts here. Yay! Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah. So, 
when you first you know became a dancer, do you go through any kind of like training? Like it, like does the like how do you know what to do? Like if a girl like let's say a girl walks in today and she says, uh, you know, I want to be a stripper, what is the process? So nowadays, and then especially me, of course, um, like I help dancers with their hustle, like that's a part of my business, but I did not have any help and there was no there was no like stripper really how to out there that I knew of. I knew there are some. Later on I found that there are some out there. Um, but usually it's just like you do a shot and you just try and figure it out. Like I kind of drunkenly stumbled through my first <laughs> six months because also people can tell you what to do or they can explain, but you really do have to figure it out for yourself and experience it because there's nothing like learning a lesson from just doing it yourself, which I'm sure you know from your experiences <laughs> of, be of being a male stripper. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that you know. I know why. I know why you're interviewing me. <laughs> uh, to get you get some more uh, tips. Uh, actually, uh, my job during college was a valet parker, and I would show up every Monday with a stack of dollar bills. You know, some like 150 or 200 dollars worth of dollar bills to the bank, where I would just you know whenever I would go out to a restaurant or somewhere, I would just pay with stacks of dollar bills, and people would always look at me and just and just probably assume I was a stripper. That's <laughs> so that was your taste. That was your <laughs> yeah your little taste. That, that yeah. was enough. What do you think that the typical lifespan is for a stripper? Like 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 you said, you started when you were nineteen. How old are you now? Um, I'm twenty four. Okay, so you're so, still making good money, but like, what do you have like a plan? Like, say, like I'm gonna strip for you know until I'm you know X age, and then I'm gonna stop, or what, what, like, what is your plan? Yeah, that's that's the thing. I don't think everyone should hustle forever. God, I don't think, man. It's it's hard to say because I know there's a lot of older women that kill it in the club, but it's it does get really tough on your body. You know, inhaling a lot of smoke and drinking just things like that, just the environmental factors. So I do think, I think five to 10 years is a good lifespan, honestly. And I think me personally, I am building this business outside of the club and I have the bachelor party side hustle. And that's kind of nice because it's like one or two days a week. And that's really great. Like that's what I'm pretty much down to at the most right now with hustling. So I don't really have plans to go back into the club, honestly, unless I want to maybe for fun or maybe like one day a week of some kind and keep up the bachelor party hustle for as long as I'd like. But yeah, I don't really it, I'm pretty much phasing that out after about like five years, I'd okay. say five to 10 years, five to 10 years, use it, but don't stay in there forever. So I think, a, I mean, at least the story is a lot of girls will, you know, become dancers when they're 18 or 19 and use it as a way to pay for college or university or to buy their first car, maybe their first house. Out of the girls yeah. that you've met or you've heard from, what percentage of them do you, do you think actually come out of it with either, you know, paid, you know, a house or a car paid off, you know, maybe not a car because it's a, it's a liability, but like, a, you know, something tangible, like paid for the university, paid for a house or had, you know, money saved up invested versus how many girls wake up five years later or, you know, five or 10 years older and, you know, they just have a bunch of, of clothes in their closet that they never wore. Yeah, it's definitely, it's half and half. I would have to say it's half and half because I've met and collaborated with so many amazing strippers that are just doing just doing amazing things and they've created this freedom for themselves but there's also like that other half where it's just it's kind of living shift to shift and and that that's just kind of getting stuck in the wake up hustle spend it repeat oh i can just make it back just make it back so definitely i'd say Probably half and half, okay. I'd have to say. Yeah. I would have guessed it was much lower. <laughs> I would have guessed that, you know, 95% of girls yeah. are just spending the money and not saving or buying anything with it. Yeah, so maybe I am. I'm, I'd say, like, 75% are probably, like, just kind of rolling with it and enjoying the ride. Yeah, I, I'd say. 
<laughs> so for the girls that you do know that have, you know, saved their money or kind of or invested it, like what, like, did they, like, what are some examples of things they've done, you know, college, house, investments? Yeah. So I know um, girls that have, you know, paid their cars off, um, bought houses, um, bought condos, like investment properties, things like that. Um, I just actually knew, know of a girl who she bought an apartment complex. Like, so she bought a whole apartment complex. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and there's actually, so again, there's not a lot of girls that I know that are investing their money. Um, there's a few girls that I know. There's actually one that I'm learning from who is all about like investing. But yeah, most, most strippers are not investing their money. Like, at least yeah. the ones I know. Makes sense. <laughs> T- tell them to listen to the podcast. <laughs> I know. That's why. I, yeah. That's why I was like, hmm. So, ooh, okay. I have a question for you. I'm also Please. a podcaster. So let me like mm-hmm. flip the switch on you. Uh, so what would you recommend for what, like, where, where would you recommend for a stripper that doesn't know what the fuck they're doing, but they have this cash? What would you recommend they start with? I would recommend, uh, uh th- three parts one is have six months of living expenses in a, a savings account that's a completely separate separate savings account not not your checking account uh have it somewhere where you can actually earn some interest most people you know they have their money in bank of america or Wells, Wells Fargo or something and, and you get zero percent but there are banks that actually pay one percent or more so at least you're getting something and then i would have a fixed amount every month like whether you choose a percentage whether it's ten percent or twenty percent or whatever it is, and have it basically before you spend anything, you put that money into like an index fund, which is basically you're buying uh, a small piece of the entire stock market, which allows you not to have to pick and choose or make you know crazy investments or like talk to your you know your crazy you know cousin about like what's you know if you should buy Facebook stock or <laughs> Tesla stock, but you're basically just like betting that you know things you know the economy is going to slowly get more expensive, you know, over the next five or 10, 20 years. And then maybe I would even put another percent, like part of it into something you can't touch until you're retired to 55 or 65, because that'll guarantee that when you wake up one day, you're going to have that money set aside that you couldn't have touched anyways. Cause I think that the, the two kind of biggest constraints for pro- probably most people living this lifestyle is they're, having fun so they're not really thinking about the future and they also kind of assume they can continue doing it forever so if they yep. don't make a plan it's it, they're probably going to end up wake you know woke up one day thinking oh man like what did i just do with the last 7 years yeah yep yeah yeah definitely good stuff yeah so uh on that that note uh another question from the our the boss lounge is a boob job a good investment for this line of work? Like, do girls actually make more money? <laughs> I'm sitting here with my B cup titties right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting because, again, it's, yeah. So it's, <laughs> man, <laughs> I've done just fine with my natural tits. It almost kind of makes me, it makes me a, uh, like a fairy tale creature. They're like, wow, you're a stripper with natural boobs. That's crazy. So it kind of sets me apart. It already kind of puts me in this like natural girl type. And I also don't really wear makeup. I let my hair just kind of do what it does. So I, I have this really natural look about me and people like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's different, especially because so many girls take a lot of time to do their makeup and do their hair and, you know, get their titties done or whatever it is. So, I've found great success with kind of pivoting away from that and it's exciting and it's fresh. I know a lot of girls that have gotten boob jobs and they, they do, they do good. Um, I I'd say, especially nowadays, it's more about the ass than the tits. It used to be, I feel like it used to be a rite of passage for strippers where (laughs) it's like, all right, I made my first 10 K let's go get a boob job. It used to be just kind of a part of it. And now it's not, not as much definitely not as much and honestly a lot of guys are like i prefer natural natural boobs than the fake ones a lot of times so yeah another random question from the, from the lounge is 
have besides money like have people ever brought you random gifts yeah i have had yeah i've had people that um let's see like someone bought me shoes before you know i do have customers that prefer to like you know cover like expenses or like pay for specific things or you know just have me say like oh i'd really like this or i'd really like this and they like to get it for me so sometimes yeah sometimes guys prefer rather than just like handing you the cash they want to get you something so it makes sense what what are some examples of that would they be like clothes or like makeup i don't know yeah yeah so an outfit shoes um, like a specific expense, like, oh, oh, I'd love to pay this or that. Or I've had customers that, you know, will pay for a vacation house for me or something. Like if I'm going out of town, like they'll pay for the the house with my friends or something like that. So, right. yeah, pretty random but fun. <laughs> I like it. Very cool. Um, yeah. So when you – like, do you have a shift, like, like a schedule, like a normal job or like, you're like, I'm working, you know, Monday through, you know, Saturday this week from seven to 10. How does that work? There are some places where you are required to make a schedule, but most places you're not. So you kind of go in when you want. And then it all, usually the house fee is based on the time you get there. And generally when you arrive later in the, in the night, it's going to be more money. So it's really just like how much are you willing to pay to work, really? Okay. Yeah, and that's a crazy concept because I think that doesn't really exist anywhere else where you're literally paying nope. $100 to have the privilege of working that day and you still have to give yeah. a cut. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's just the reality. <laughs> so why are we not yeah. all opening strip clubs? Sounds like a great investment. That's the question. I know that's like the question I'm, I'm asking myself. Yeah, definitely. Once once all this is over, I mean, it's a fucking money pit. It's a fucking money pit. Yeah, and I feel like if, as a strip club owner, if you actually treated the girls with, you know, respect and didn't fucking nickel and dime them to get to death, that could just even be more profitable, giving girls a good place to work. I am very, very curious how much the strip club owners actually make. Do you have, do you have any idea, any guess? At least the one in my city, I know that he's at least a fucking, he's a millionaire. I'm not really sure of exact figures or numbers. He owns multiple clubs in the area, though. Like, he has, like, three, three or four. So he kind of has, like, a monopoly almost. But, um, but yeah, I have to say most strip club owners are at least, like, I would have to say at least pulling six figures, multiple six figures, easily. And easily. How much- how much do you think most most dancers on average are making a year kind of after everything? Man, it really I think a girl that's savvy and consistent is at least making like 70 to 100,000. Um the most I've I've heard of like girls in Vegas that have made like 300,000 a year before, right? Depending on your market, depending on your hustle, you can make multiple six figures. I'd say generally on the on the lower end because there's obviously going to be people in the struggle that make like 20 or 30k. I'd say between like 50,000 and 80,000 is a good kind of median, I'd say generally. Okay. I love it. This, this has been super yeah. fun. I really enjoyed uh, yeah. speaking with you. It, it, and you have a podcast. Yes. So if, if somebody wants to take a listen and, you know, maybe they want to be a dancer, maybe they have a, a ah. girlfriend or a sister that wants to be a dancer, uh, it's called yes. the Hustle Like a Stripper podcast. What, what, what's, what's on that? Oh, it's everything. It's everything. So the concept is that everyone could learn how to hustle like a stripper just – with mindset, with, you know, finances, it's, it's pretty much just a melting pot of everything. It is, it's whatever strippers need to know. And whoever is curious about the lifestyle. Um, I talk a lot about like entrepreneurship mindset. We get into some spirituality sometimes. It's pretty much a good melt of everything. I have talked about investing on there before, so I'll have to have you on my show. I've never, I've never had a guy on my podcast actually. Yeah, I'd be happy to come on. I, I think dancers need to 
investor the freaking money because I think it's a, such a smart like move to to make yeah a crazy amount of money, but you know in the small window for doing something you know I would assume is kind of fun, but if you're you know yeah. if someone like ends up five years or ten years down the line at the end of the career with nothing, then like what was it all for? Yep, exactly. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah, you're like. I'm like, shit, I need to start investing. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Uh, yeah. L- Lauren, thank you so much for being on the show. If you guys want to check out her her website, it's lusciouslifestylebylauren.com. And we'll have links to that in the show notes. Uh, Lauren, anything uh, you want to say to everybody before you sign off? I think we cover covered it all. Yeah. I guess part two will be on Hustle Like a Stripper. So you'll have to wait. <laughs> I love it. Well, that goes without saying that I thoroughly enjoyed this episode, Johnny. <laughs> Thank you for forcing me to do this one. It, it was funny because it, it, if, if you guys have been listening to the last 146 episodes before this, I've only done a few of the, the interviews. It's usually Sam. But recently, we, we were actually talking, saying, you know, I should do more of them just because Sam's getting busier and I'm just, you know, hanging out surfing in Sri Lanka. And it just happened that this was going to be the first one that I did, not because it was a it was a talking to a stripper, it just it was my turn. And at first, I was kind of dreading it, honestly, thinking like, what am I going to ask her? Like, I don't want to do this like interview <laughs> format. And then, you know, we hop on uh, on Skype, and she's gorgeous, and we start just having a great time. And I'm like, this is a good life. This is a great job. Mm. Did you do it on video? Yeah, and sorry for the, the couple times it uh, it dropped off for a second. I was tempted to kill the video, but she was sitting there topless the whole time, so I, I just couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> I was I was going to ask you that after the episode. Oh, no, no, man. No, no. She, she wasn't. I'll no, tell you no, what, no. Johnny. She, she, she had a tank as, on, but, as you start, but still. <laughs> I, I, thought it was super, I thought it was super fun how she kind of uh, interacted with you and asked you for advice, and I was thinking while that was happening, I'm, I'm like – if Johnny walks away from this interview with a consulting job for strip investment coaching for strippers, you better bring me in 50-50 on that. You know, you, you, yeah, you, you could be you could be a partner. Yeah. Like I'll probably have so much business that I'm not to give you some. But actually, oh right my god, after, it's such a great yeah. niche, actually. It is, and it's smart because they all make a lot of money, and all of them are terrible at at investing. Like literally, the worst. You know, possible except for i mean there, there's a few people who had their heads on the shoulders but i would estimate less than five percent actually walk away you know with the majority of their money you know we could do a we could do like a three four day crash course where we get an rv in florida and we drive it out to, to las vegas and we we offer free transit to las vegas so they can dance in las vegas and then we bring them back to Florida, and the whole way is just an investing crash course on a, on a rock star, rock star tour bus. Uh, I'd rather just fly. Uh, was it Spirit Airline? Spirit? Oh man, come on, Johnny. <laughs> well, Definitely I, not Spirit. Dude, I thought she was super cool. I thought she was super cool, and um, she's from Florida, which was great because when she was talking, I'm like, uh, it sounds sounds like she could be, you know, someone I went to school with, and it's just, you know, the, the Florida shows through in them. Cheery, perky, yeah. good humor. Yeah, super fun, super, super down to earth. <laughs> uh, I actually, right after our interview, uh, we took a little break, and she called me back to do an interview on her show, and and I just gave investing advice, you know, for for an hour. Oh man, when's that gonna air? Uh, I mean, you know, you, you never know. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be the well, next episode. Be it might be out, but we'll, we'll, share, we'll share it. Share we'll, yeah, we'll, in, yeah. We'll share it in the Boss Lounge. If you guys haven't joined the Boss Lounge, it's our f- private Facebook group. Go to investlikeaboss.com, click on bonus. Uh, and if you sign up for the email list, you'll get an invite to our private Facebook group. We can interact with other members. We share you know, other kind of fun things like this. And sometimes we'll ask you guys for questions in advance, but usually that only goes to the Patreon members. So if you want to support the show, go to investlikeaboss.com, click on Patreon or support the show. There we let you know what the episodes are going to be before they air. So you can ask, you can submit your, your questions for the guests. Mm. Johnny, it might be fun to just talk about some of the things that we confirmed in learning on this episode because there was there was a lot of them and it was 
it was interesting to hear her perspective on so many different things, including, you know, investments in yourself. Like, are are boobs a good investment? Well, not not necessarily. It can be, it can be. I mean, but not not necessarily. Braces probably are, but really, it's probably just good dance skills, a good tan, and you know. I don't Probably know. Probably a good hairstyle, but investing in a bunch of different like outfits and stuff that you're just going to take off anyways. Probably not a smart move. Yeah, definitely. And and I would beg to differ with the the tan, the hairstyle, and like all of that. I, I think everyone has a niche. I think mm-hmm. I really believe that you know if there's only one of us, and maybe we're not the, even the best version, but if we just kind of own it and say like this, you know, we're not going to try to copy everyone else and be. A, uh, a lesser model of, of someone else. We just do our own thing. Mm-hmm. I think I think there's an niche for everyone. I, I think there's some guys that like girls with messed up teeth. I think there's guys that like super pale girls that glow in the club, you know, under under the the backlight. I think there's something for mm-hmm. everyone. Yeah, and I I think it was really interesting also how she talked about just different nights, different energy. Sometimes you go in there and you just strike it out and you just leave frustrated, weren't getting anywhere. And other, other times there's just energy in the crowd and everyone's throwing money out and taking dances and going to the champagne room. And that's gotta be, uh, I mean, it's, it's basically like any other sales job, right? I mean, some days you go, you go to the office, you swing and you, you miss every single time you, you leave empty handed. And other times you crush it and you, you bring home five hundred five thousand dollars, like she said yeah. she did one night. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think of it as, like you know, when I, when I worked sales, and you know, this was like Best Buy, good guys, so just like electronic sales. A lot of it was just, you know, staying positive and talking to everybody like they are a potential client. So instead of thinking mm-hmm. like, oh, this guy looks broke, or he has, you know, some uh, some like yellow uh, New Balance you know, kind of tennis shoes on. He's, he probably doesn't have any money. You know, if you just kind of go up to everyone, give them a fair chance to be, be polite to everyone and just kind of give it your all, kind of go through the go through the spiel, you never know who is going to be that tech millionaire, that tech millionaire uh, who wants to spend money. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. I, I almost bet there's a, an opposite correlation in the strip club with who looks like they have money and who actually has money, you know. I, I grew up in Florida, go into all the strip joints in Florida, and you get all these super flashy people, big necklaces and slick back hair and everything. And then you, of course, have the, the guys in the, like she said, the New Balances in the corner with just a black crew cut shirt. Um, and that, that's got that's really got to play into a lot of the strategy when they go in every night because no matter what you do, you're profiling people. And it's probably, a, it's probably best just to train your brain to say, you know what, I'm not going in with any judgment on anyone's looks. I'm just playing – playing everything fair because it seemed like from from her perspective you just you couldn't take judgment in uh and apply it or you just you'd end up going in the wrong direction or letting yourself down thinking that somebody's got money and it turns out they don't yeah or not willing to spend it definitely makes sense actually my so my favorite strip club in the world is in san francisco it's called gold club or no is it larry hmm. Hill? maybe it's either gold yeah i think it's larry flint's Gold Club or Hustle Club or it's one of those. It's the one with the the five dollar buffet, the lunch buffet, and it's right downtown where all the startups are. So you know all the big kind of tech startups are you know within a few blocks of it. And I think I think it's something like mm-hmm. Monday through Friday they have a five dollar buffet, and it's really good. They have fried chicken, spaghetti, they have you know fresh fruit. They have it's it's just like a nice spread. And what it is is they want to attract, you know, these tech guys who are cheap because they're used to, you know, getting either free food or just like they just like, you know, good value to go there with all their yeah. friends as kind of an excuse. And there will be like guys and girls and go in a group of like ten or twenty people. None of them will even really look at the girls because they, you know, they're kind of too shy about it. They're like, oh yeah, we're just here for the fried chicken. But what happens is they get that stamp on their wrist that allows them to come back any time that day for free. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Out of you know twenty guys, there's there's gonna be a couple of guys that go back after work and end up spending a lot of money. Yeah, that's right. Well, actually, what I'm most shocked about in that statement, Johnny, is that your favorite strip club in the world, given all the places you've been and all the strip clubs you visited around the world, is in San Francisco. Actually, yeah, it, it is ironic, right? 
you know, what she was talking about, kind of the hustle, right? And that's that's where they, you know, that's how they can make the big money. But whenever I've gone to these places, I, I like to just sit back and not be hustled. I like to sit back and have a cocktail and watch the dancing, you know, uninterrupted. And what you find, especially in South Florida, I mean, the hustle is real. If there is somebody constantly, constantly in your lap asking for dances, having chat and like, Sometimes all you want to do is kind of sit back and, and chill out, kind of like the ones that we went to in, in Eastern Europe, right? Much more chilled out, just kind of sit back with a cocktail and and uh, take it chill. So I don't know. I prefer that style a little bit more, but I totally get from the dancer's perspective that that's not where the money is. Yeah, I, I think for me, I have a – like I like – the attention. I like to always have a dancer sitting next to me. I, I I find their lives fascinating. And to be honest, I mean, as much as I like seeing beautiful girls, uh, naked especially, I honestly <laughs> enjoy hearing their story, hearing their thoughts. I get some of the best investing advice from the, uh, talking to strippers. And it's not, you know, I don't follow their advice. I literally just do the exact opposite of what, what they're doing. But it's really mm -hmm. good information. Oh, I just had a flashback when you're saying that. It was in Las Vegas, Spearmint Rhino. Yeah, it was a great right? place. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tipped that girl $150 just to sit next to me and talk to me. Like no dancing, nothing. Just sit down and, and it was exactly the same thing. I'm like, wow, I'm learning so much about the industry and the business and just kind of enjoying talking that, you know, wasn't – was just good chat. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And you're yeah. a little bit more extroverted in that type of setting than I am as well. But, but I wonder, Johnny, you know, what if what if Johnny was a female? Instead of going to Thailand and kickboxing and doing dive classing to get by, uh, dive classes to support yourself and get by, would would female Johnny have turned into a dancer? That's an interesting thought. Yeah, uh, not if I was 200 pounds like <laughs> I am now, but. <laughs> Hey, like you said, everyone's got their niche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It would be fun. Honestly, I, I would definitely uh, consider doing it because it's just like it's it's a, a cash grab. You know, if you're in your if you're like yeah. eighteen uh, to you know twenty five or eighteen to thirty, and you're like, you know what? I really want to go to university, but I don't want to come out with fifty grand in student loans. I you know I don't blame you if if you wanted to yeah. to dance on the side, or even better is. The girls who live in LA and go to school, go to UCLA or you know uh, one of these good schools, and every Friday they hop on a plane to Vegas, they dance for two days, they come back on Sunday or Monday, they work two days a week, and they make enough to pay for for everything, for the rent, for Dude. school, for everything. Not only do I not blame you, I respect you. You know, mm -hmm. get out ahead, get out of debt, do your thing, do what you got to do, set yourself up for better decades ahead you know yeah so I mean, you hear all these it, it's it's basically like our arbitrage and location arbitrage in a lot of ways right you hear these stories and we talk about it a lot but you know you also um in florida we would always hear girls that would go up to nantucket it's like a whaling island off the northeast of the usa and they would go up and work you know like two months in the summer just bussing tables and waiting on tables and they would make enough to not work the rest of the year and just go to school because Everything was so expensive up there. Same when like Norway, people would go up and, and wait tables in Norway over some summer for two months, come back and have enough money to go go through go to school and not have to work a job at the same time. And all respect by me, man. Yep, I definitely agree. It's good stuff. Uh, talking to Lauren, it made me realize I haven't been to a strip club since last summer. It's been, it's been like a year, and I I miss it. It's it's been fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope to find uh, those in Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah, so I hope this this interview, uh, this fun you know episode, sparks some interest for you guys and gals listening. I hope it was interesting to hear about the strip club economics, but also just Lauren's story. I think it was just it was fun. I think it was a nice needed break from all the you know all the heaviness in our mm -hmm. podcast feeds and on the news this last month. Maybe we'll do a boss meetup and, and invite Lauren and her crew to come hang out. And our boss meetups are for guys and girls. We always have a lot of girls show up. And and I think a lot of girls actually enjoy going to strip clubs. They enjoy it. It's fun. They see, see girls dancing. They like interacting with them. So I don't, I don't think it's just a, a, a destination for guys to hang out because I've definitely seen girls have as much fun as guys in those environments. Yeah, I could definitely see that. So 
I don't know, maybe the next uh, Invest Like a Boss meetup could be in Vegas if it opens back up, or maybe somewhere in Eastern Europe. I think that could be fun. Let us know in the Boss Lounge. Give it a vote. Where do you want to meet? Where do you guys want to hang out? I think we're, 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 as soon as travel opens up uh, and we get to meet up again, we're definitely going to invite out the Patreons, yeah. whoever's a member, yeah, to wherever, wherever Sam and I are at. Yep. Mm. Long, long overdue. Long, long overdue. Well, Johnny, thanks for, for uh, you know getting on this, this interview and, and doing that. I think that's, that's certainly a fun one to, to throw into our broader net of uh, 150 episodes. But next week, we're going to have, uh, as we talked about in the intro, Big quarterly update. This one is going to be packed with a lot, lot of stuffs going on, both personally and professionally. I think it's sort of almost a pivotal moment in a lot of people's lives with this COVID. People are rethinking how they're approaching life, decisions, uh, investments, all, all, all aspects of life. And I know that's certainly true for for myself. And I know Johnny's made a lot of moves um, while being in Sri Lanka with, uh, you know, pretty light itinerary over the last four months. So stay tuned to that. Johnny, I'm looking forward to connecting for that. We might have to carve out a couple of hours because I think it's going to get going to get pretty involved. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be excited. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm not sure uh, how much Derek was able to, to dig up on the uh, investment side of actually owning or buying a strip club. But if he if he has any info, we'll attack it on the end of this episode. But as far as I know from, from my experience uh, and the people I've spoken to – Casinos, strip clubs, and all, you know, and these other kind of gray, uh, gray market area businesses, where it's hard to get into. It has a huge, you know, wall. Most cities don't mm-hmm. want strip clubs or casinos going into their city, so they just kind of reject it. They they allow uh, ones that are grandfathered in to, to remain. So the only way to, you know, basically own a strip club or own a casino is. Either you need to take over an existing one, and they seldom go for sale on sale because there's such a you know a lucrative cash business, um, mm-hmm. or they get sold to someone else kind of within their network. And also with casinos, same thing where it's really hard to start a new one. You need to basically you know hire lobbyists and try to try to get in somehow if if, if that's the route you want to take. So it's going to be mm-hmm. tough, but it is a yeah. very lucrative business. Yeah, guys, and we'll try to do a part two of this that will be with a strip club. But for the reasons that Johnny just said, it's actually quite challenging to get guests to come on and talk about the business, probably because other people in the industry don't want them talking about it publicly. But we'll continue to dig in and see if we can find someone to come in and talk about the other half of the business, which is the actual strip club economics. So if any of you bosses listen to this, own a strip club or know someone (laughs) who does, let us know. We would love to, to, to chat. For sure, for sure. All right, guys, that was a fun episode. And a big thanks again for all the Patreons who've been supporting the show. Without you, we wouldn't have Derek. We wouldn't have uh, all these interviews. We wouldn't have all these episodes. We probably, honestly, probably just have one a month if it wasn't for having Derek on the team. So big thank you to the Patreons. If you want to become one, support the show, and have early access to things like being able to ask guests, future guest questions and the private meetups whenever that opens back up again. Go to investlikeaboss.com, click on Patreon, support the show. And if you like this podcast and you want to leave a review, please go on iTunes uh, and you know give us a shout. If you didn't like this episode, I'm sorry, please don't leave a review. Our, our other episodes aren't <laughs> normally like this. So this was just a kind of fun one off. And don't worry, we're going to get back to our regularly scheduled financial tips and investments uh, after this episode. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I enjoyed it, Johnny. I'll give us a good review for it. All right, I did as well. All right, Sam, good <laughs> catching up. And all of you guys, I uh, hope you're having a great week, and we'll see you next week. Ciao, ciao. Hey, bosses, it's Derek. Just a few things before we wrap up this episode. Johnny had asked me to see what it takes to run an actual strip club from the owner's perspective. We heard from Lauren on the dancer's side. Uh, I was able to find a rarity in the business, which is pretty cool. An actual female strip club owner. The business is vastly run by males. Uh, This particular owner wanted to stay anonymous, but I can tell you that her club is in the eastern United States, and they are currently shut down for COVID right now, but hopefully 
They can be back open soon. Now, this club runs things a little bit differently than you heard Lauren talk about. She had mentioned that she's an independent contractor. Now, the dancers at this particular club are actually employees. They are paid a minimum wage and they get to keep all their tips on top of that. So very similar to a server. And if they get a dance, the house charges $30 for a dance. 20 of that goes to the house. The girl gets 10. And of course, she gets to keep any tips on top of that amount. So I wasn't able to get a uh, full profit margin on the club or any actual revenue figures, but I was able to get a sales breakdown just to give you an idea of where the revenue is coming in from. So about 40% of the revenue for this particu particular club is coming from liquor, 30% from dances, and the remaining 30% would be from cover door charges. They actually charge a fee just to enter into the club. So issues with running a club, you can imagine there are quite a few in that business. First off, it's finding good employees. Now, this particular club I was talking about, since they are employees, they actually don't like hiring experienced dancers. All of their new dancers have never danced anywhere else before, and that's the way they like it, to kind of set a precedence of what their club is like and how it should be run instead of girls coming back and saying, oh, this club does that and that club does this. This club doesn't seem to follow that rule and they want to set their own precedent of how to run things. And secondly, to go along with that, uh, it sounds like they do invest a lot of their time into girls, but one big issue is they get flaky people. Now that it's really hard to get reliable employees, you know, they'll, they'll invest a lot of time in a girl and get her trained and then she'll just disappear. I guess that's just the way of the business. Um, other issues outside of the club seem to be litigation from the city, from landlords, whoever it might be. Nosy neighbors, that is a, definitely a big issue. Uh, no one wants to be the building next to a strip club. This particular club actually used to have about four or five neighbors in the last 20 some years that they've been in business. And currently they are the only game left in town. No other strip clubs except for them because they've all been pushed out of town. So it sounds like the key to success is you got to keep the neighbors happy. You got to keep the riffraff out. You got to keep the crime down and you got to be very hands on. Uh, this is not a business to get in if you want to just be partying and hanging out with cute girls all the time because that's not going to work. It takes a lot of work to keep these clubs in business and fighting off the neighbors, basically. Now, this idea came from our coffee shop episode, which is also another hands on business. So if that's not your thing. Definitely need to think twice if you're looking into investing in a club. Well, if the hands-on approach isn't your thing, you do have an option. How about buying a stock in a strip club company? Now, I could only find one that is currently listed on the NASDAQ, so there's not much to pick from. The one I found is called RCI Holdings, ticker symbol R-I-C-K, like the name Rick. Now, they've definitely been affected by COVID, just like the owner I had talked to about their strip club, but they did report... A profit for the second quarter they are expected to take a loss for the third quarter of 2020 before everything broke out back in february of this year the stock was up over 25 dollars a share they're currently trading at about 13 dollars a share they did drop as low as seven in mid april now their market cap is pretty small they're still considered a small cap company just over a hundred million dollars but it does pay a dividend not much but it's something just under about 1% currently, it is at 0.93%. So if you're confident that strip clubs are going to be back to normal after all this craziness ends, it might be something to check out. Uh, as always, we are not recommending any investment, and we definitely suggest you do all your own research first. And I do not personally own any stock in RICK. I think that's about it for now, bosses. I'd love to hear your comments. We're going to put a post up on the uh, Facebook group, The Boss Lounge, and also on on our Patreon page for Invest Like a Boss. Definitely want to hear your comments, your thoughts. Maybe some of you have invested in a strip club or you will now. Can't wait to see your feedback. We'll talk to you next time on Invest Like a Boss. Thanks for listening to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.